finally we get to a set of numbers I've been hinting at all along. Beyond real numbers, complex numbers. Now, of course, these numbers are no more complex than any other numbers. These are, this is a historical title, but we will see where they came from and why they need to be there. So, here we go. Complex numbers. The symbol used for complex numbers is usually a capital boldface C like this. And as I said, they're called complex, but really they're no more complex than any other numbers. And one way of describing the need for such numbers is to look like I did at other number systems and ask the question, is there an equation that needs to be solved that we can't solve with the number system we currently have? Well, suppose we wanted to solve something very simple like x squared equals negative 1. You might say, well, there is no number which you can square to be negative 1. And you're right, in the real numbers there is no such number. So, if we want to solve that equation for whatever reason, we would need to have something whose square is negative 1. In other words, we need the square root of negative 1, whatever that may be. Well, it turns out the only way to deal with that is to introduce a new number into the real number system, a number that wasn't there presently. All right, so let's go ahead and do that. Definition. The number is going to be called i. That's the traditional lettering for this. i is the new, this is a new number, the new number such that, what is the property that i has? Well, it is the number that you square to get minus 1. So we'll say, is the new number such that i squared is equal to minus 1? Now, i is not a real number. It is an addition to the real number system. Okay, I'll even put under here, just to remind you, meaning, of course, that i is the square root of minus 1. Okay? What is this usually uh, referred to as? It's usually referred to as an imaginary number. Once again, that's a historical word. i for imaginary is where this i comes from. It is a historical word. The number is not imaginary any more than any other number. Okay? In fact, it turns out that historically, this equation was not the first equation that people looked at to worry about whether or not a new number needed to be added. It turned out that actually they looked at cubics first, interestingly enough. But now we have this new number. We want to ask what sort of properties it has and what is, what, how we can des describe the entire set of complex numbers. Because as I said, that's an imaginary number. All right, here is the definition of complex numbers. So definition, complex numbers. Well, as with all of our previous number sets, complex numbers will include all of the numbers we have, the real numbers in particular. But complex numbers have the, once again, another standard form appears, lots of these in mathematics, has the standard form A plus BI. So that's the standard form, a plus b times i, standard form of a complex number. Now what are the a and the b? The a and the b, of course, are real numbers, because those are the only numbers we have prior to this complex number system. And i, of course, is the number we just defined. So anything that is of this form, where we've multiplied i by something and added possibly something to it, is called a complex number. There are some other words currently used here. For A, A is sometimes called the real part of this complex number. And B is sometimes called, well, you guessed it, the imaginary part. Of course, as I said, it's not imaginary, it's a real number. Now, there is something interesting that happens that you've never seen before in a number system. When we proceeded from the natural numbers up to the integers, up to the rational numbers, up to the real numbers, we never lost any properties. In fact, we gained properties. We lose now. We lose what? Well, recall that the real numbers is an ordered set. What does that mean? That means if I give you two real numbers, you can tell me whether they are equal or one is bigger than the other. C is not ordered. There is no way that these numbers can be put in a linear order like the real numbers. That is one of the things you lose by adding this new number, this i number. So that's an interesting fact about 
creating new number systems in case you thought we would continue to create number systems and keep adding numbers even to the complex numbers. The fact is we can't do that without starting to lose properties we'd like to have. Okay, well, in the complex numbers, there are some things that stay pretty much the same. Addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division are as usual. That means as in the real numbers, remembering, of course, the one fact that you need to remember, that i squared, whenever it appears, is equal to minus 1. Now, this will introduce a few kinks in the, pro in the process of, say, multiplying and dividing complex numbers that I will discuss in a moment. But since we're talking about i here, let's go ahead and talk a little further about it. Notice the following facts about i, because if you do, it'll make your work a lot easier. i, okay? i to the 1 is just i. i squared, of course, is minus 1. That's the definition of i. Now let's go a little higher. i cubed. Well, I can write that as i times i squared, remembering our exponent rules. Now i squared is minus 1. I just stays its by itself, so this becomes minus I. What about I to the fourth? Well, if I write this as I squared times I squared, I squared is minus 1. Minus 1 times minus 1 is 1. And then everything repeats. There are only four different possible results. Four results. You can get I. You can get minus 1, you can get minus i, or you can get plus 1, and that's it. Let me just show you a couple more to convince you of that. i to the fifth. Well, that's i times i to the fourth. See, I'm picking my factorization judiciously. i to the fourth is 1. So this is just i, and notice I've started repeating. i to the sixth. Well, that's i to the fifth times i. I can start repeating this way. i to the fifth is i. So this is i times i. I squared, of course, is minus 1. And I'm starting to repeat. And that will continue. So all you really need to know is that there are only four, four pro possible products when you take a power of i. Let me show you an example now, how one can simplify an, a, a rather high power of i very easily. Suppose you look at i to the 101 power. OK, that's too hard to deal with. We know that we can simplify this. One way to do it is, and this is not the only way, this is just one that appeals to me right now, I'm going to rewrite this as i to the 100 times i to the 1, okay? Because 100 plus 1 is 101. Now, i to the 1 I can't do anything with, that's just i. i to the 100, I'm going to re, I'm going to factor the 100 into 4 times 25. You see, I'm looking for that factor of 4. Because once I have that, I can rewrite this as i to the 4th to the 25th power times i. Remember, i to the 4th to the 25th is i to the 4 times 25. That's one of the exponent rules. But i to the 4th is very nice. i to the 4th is what? It's just 1. So I have 1 to the 25th times i. Well, 1 to the 25th is 1. So I, lo and behold, I have i. So i to the 101 is just i. Now, it's a lot easier to deal with a single i than it is to deal with a very high power. So this is something you want to try on your own and make sure you're comfortable with it. Let's go ahead and look at a couple of other of these operations that need to be examined, taking a product of two complex numbers. So what we want to do in all of these cases is write our solution in the a plus bi form. Remember I said that's a standard form, and we want to write all our solutions that way. So here's the problem I want to pose. 5 plus 3i times 2 plus 7i. Now there's two perfectly good complex numbers written in standard form, and I'd like to multiply them. Well, you may notice that these are binomials. And we know how to multiply binomials. We can take the first term here, multiply it times each of the second terms there. Let's go ahead and do that. This is equals 5 times 2, of course, is 10. 5 times 7i is then 35i. And then 3i times 2, which will give me 6i. And then 3i times 7i, I get 21 from the 3 times 7. And then I get i squared. But i squared is going to simplify because, recall, again, i squared is minus 1. So what do I have here? I have 10 and the 35 and the 6 I can now add. 
plus 41i, and now I have minus 21, because 21 times minus 1 is minus 21. And finally, I can write this as minus 11 plus 41i, and that is in standard form. The minus 11 is the a, and the 41 is the b. Okay? It's just that simple. So, practicing the factoring of binomials has bearing when you deal with complex numbers. Okay, well this introduces something I can define at this point. This is something that's unusual. It's, you don't have this fact in the real numbers. If you have a plus bi and you have a minus bi, then these two are kind of companions. They're called conjugates of each other. Conjugates of each other. That's the technical term here. Now all that's happened is that the sign, the plus or minus sign, has changed in the two of them. And there's a notation for this. If you want to find the conjugate of a number, we write that if you take a plus bi and you put a bar over it, my bar is a little bit crooked there, but you put a bar over it, you get its conjugate. That's what the bar means. Okay, this is a bar. It means find the conjugate of whatever's underneath. Or, of course, if you start with a minus bi and you put the bar over it, you will get a plus bi. So that's what conjugates mean. Now, there'll be a nice thing that happens with conjugates, which is the reason I introduced the definition right now. Let us now look at the case of division of complex numbers. So suppose we want to divide 1 plus 4i over 5 minus 7i. Now, you may notice that this is a binomial over a binomial. We can actually make this much simpler and we'll use the fact that these numbers, complex numbers, have conjugates. And here's the idea. We don't want an i in the denominator. All right? We want nothing down here that has a complex i in it. So to get rid of that, watch what I do. First, I'll rewrite the number. 1 plus 4i and 5 minus 7i times, and then I will multiply it top and bottom by the same thing, which of course won't change anything. The bottom will be multiplied by its conjugate. See, this is 5 plus 7i, the conjugate of 5 minus 7i. And that is the number I will multiply on top and bottom. Now, what good does that do? Watch what happens here. On the top, I get whatever I get. I have 1 plus 4i times 5 plus 7i. They're just two binomials, nothing special there. Let's go ahead and do the multiplication. First term of this binomial is 1 times 5 and then 1 times 7i. So I'll get 5 plus 7i back. And then 4i times 5 will give me 20i. And then 4i times 7i will give me 28i squared. And we know the nice thing that will happen there, i squared, remember, is minus 1. That's going to simplify. Now watch what happens on the bottom. This is really the crucial part. 5 times 5, of course, is 25. 5 times 7i is 35 7i, but I'm not going to write it down because look what happens next. Then I take minus 7i times 5 and I have minus 35i. Because of the negative signs, the middle terms here add to 0. So I'm only left with minus 49, that's 7i times 7i, 49i squared. And because of i squared, definition as minus 1, there will be no i's down here when I'm finished. So I think I can squeeze in one more line here. On the top, let's see, these two can add, and the 28 multiplied by i squared is minus 28. 5 minus 28 is minus 23, and then I have plus 27i from those two adding here. On the bottom, I have i squared, which is minus 1, times minus 49 is plus 49. And 25 plus 49, if you get a little, give it a little bit of thought, is 74. And then we'll finish this on the next page here. Just continuing my equal signs. I now will have minus 23, bringing the 74 under each part. Minus 23 over 74 plus 27 over 74 times i. And there I finally have it in the standard form I was looking for. This is the a part and this is the b part or if you like, the real part and the imaginary part. So the key there, and let me bring back the previous page, 
The key there was to multiply top and bottom by the conjugate of the bottom. And that will solve all your problems with division of complex numbers. Now, something very pleasant is going to happen. We had, if you remember, a hole in our list of factoring formulas. We can now fill that hole. Fact, we can now fill a factoring gap, if you like. Remember, I had a pair of binomials written out in general form. And I said, we did not have a pair that would equal the sum of two squares. This is the sum of squares. We had a formula for the difference of squares, but not for the sum of squares. And you might suspect that an x would go in this place to give you x times x equals x squared. But we had no possible factorization there. I said we would get to it in the complex numbers. Well, here we are, and here's what we'll get. x plus ai and x minus ai. This is what makes the factorization possible. The factorization is only possible in the complex numbers. And these are just, as you now see, conjugates of each other. So there we have the final factoring formula here, if you like, the one that we left out previously, and we can fill the gap. OK, now that's all I'm going to say about the complex numbers. But before I leave, I want to summarize our number systems. So I'm going to draw you a couple of nice pictures. Here's the first one, which I will sketch out. So number systems or number sets, let's put it that way, number sets. And let's start small. Down here in the corner, let me call that the natural numbers. OK, remember what those were, 1, 2, 3, et cetera. Then we took a bigger, slightly bigger set that contained the natural numbers, which was the integers. And what did we add to that? Well, we added minus 2, minus 1, all the negative numbers, and we added 0. Then we build a, a set that's slightly larger than it. This whole large set was called the rational numbers, in which we got all of the fractions, the p over q's. Then we went a little bit further. And we built, by adding in irrationals like square root of 2 and pi, et cetera, we got the real numbers. And now finally, if we toss in i and we get numbers like a plus bi, we have finally the complex numbers. So my point is that the complex numbers include the real numbers, which include the rational, which include the integers, which include the natural numbers. We've been building a large set here. Now this is just another way of looking at the complex numbers built up from scratch. Imagine that the natural numbers are a small box like this. Then you add in the negative numbers and 0 and you have a set that looks like a rectangular solid here. That'll be the integers. If you then add in all the fractions, continuing a little further here, you will get what you could call the rational numbers. That's what the Q stands for. If you then throw in all the irrationals, as we do here, then you have a set that we've called the real numbers. And if finally you toss in all the imaginary numbers, i and a plus bi for all the a's and b's, you get the complex numbers. So you can see this nice build here from the natural numbers all the way down to the complex numbers. And the complex numbers, of course, include everything that went before. So on that note, we'll pause. And then when I come back, we'll do a little bit of geometry. And now, as the very last segment of what we're calling the unit basics, we're going to talk about a little geometry. There's, uh, there are a few things in geometry you need to know for uh, your work in algebra. There'll be a few things later on, but these, I think, will get us started. The very first one is a few area formulas, some things that I know you've seen in your past, but we'll run over, and I'll give you proofs of a couple of them. So first of all, we'll talk about a definition, and the definition will be about rectangles. So. We're talking about the rectangle, very familiar fig figure. The area of a rectangle we will simply take as given. The area is equal to a times b, where a and b are two of the adjacent sides. So in the picture that you might draw, 
as in this case. You have a rectangle. A rectangle has four right angles. If this is side A and this is side B, the area is simply the product of those two numbers. And that's where we're going to start. I'm not going to prove why that is the area of a rectangle. I think you know that. And we'll just start there. Okay, we're going to move on up to a theorem which will depend on the definition of the area of a rectangle. And this will be for a parallelogram. So we'll look at a parallelogram. Now, I don't know if you remember what a parallelogram is. It's a figure that's four-sided in which two of the sides are parallel and the other two opposite sides are also parallel. So they're parallel in pairs. Okay, that's what a parallelogram is. Here's what the theorem says. It says that the area of a parallelogram is A times B. That is going to be what you might refer to as the base times the height. Now, I'm going to give you a proof of that. And you might call this a dissection proof. So, a dissection proof. And you'll see why. A dissection proof that will go like this. Imagine that I write down a parallelogram. I draw a parallelogram here. There's a pretty good one. And let's suppose the base is A. And the height, and the height is measured perpendicularly from the base, the height is B. Now, here's how the proof will go. I want to show that the area of this is A times B. Imagine that I take this triangle here on the left and I simply pick it up and move it over here. That's the dissection part. I dissect this off and I put it over here and I attach it and I create in this new figure a rectangle. And the base here is the same as the previous base because this part that I moved away is still here is A, and the height, of course, of this rectangle is B, and so the area of the parallelogram is going to be A times B, because I can dissect it into a rectangle with the same dimensions. So, that's the area of a parallelogram. Now, why did I do that? Well, I wanted to get to this one. This is the area of a triangle. So, a triangle is a basic figure. And in this case, the area is equal to one-half the base times the height. So one-half AB. And again, let's say that A is the base and uh, B is the height. Now, what's the base of a triangle? Well, any side that you want. Let's just say that it's the side that we lay horizontally. And once again, I will go ahead and give you a dissection proof of this because this goes quickly. Let's imagine that I take the triangle and I lay it down so that its longest base, its longest side, is horizontal and will act as the base. So it might look like this. So this down here will be the base, the long horizontal side. Perpendicularly to the top of the triangle, of course, is what we call the height, sometimes called the altitude. And now I want to show that the area of this triangle is one-half A times B. Here's how I will do it. I will copy the triangle over on top of itself. Now watch what I do here. This is a copy of this triangle. And all I did was flip it over and attach it. Now look what I've got. I have two lines that are parallel, two more lines that are parallel. I have a parallelogram. What's the area of the parallelogram? It's A times B. And of course the triangle is half that, so the area of the triangle is one half A times B, as I predicted. Okay. Well, there's one more figure that's very familiar. And this is the theorem about the circle. Now, this one I won't prove. It takes a little more effort. But I think you know the formula. If this is a circle and that is its center, then there is the dimension of the distance from the center to any of one of the sides. We call that R for radius. Sometimes we want to refer to the distance across through the center. I'll draw that line a little below so you can see it. This dimension is often referred to as D for the diameter. And the distance round the circle, all the way around, is often labeled C for circumference. The circum is from the Latin meaning going around. And what is then the area? 
The area is pi times r squared. Now I've introduced this new number. We've talked about it before, but this number I'm going to explain where, so the area is pi times r squared where pi is by definition equal to c over d. Now the proof of this will be omitted, but pi is equal to the circumference over the diameter. And the interesting thing about that is that if you take any circle, circumference over diameter will always give you the same number pi. Very famous number. Now let me say a couple of words about pi, since it is famous and it turns up often enough. So let me make a note here. Note, once again, pi is c over d for any circle. And if you start writing it out, 3.1415926 dot dot dot. The dot dot dots are essential if I'm going to put an equal sign here. This is a non-repeating decimal. And you know what that means because we discussed it earlier. It means pi is irrational. So pi is an irrational number. So the decimal repeats, doesn't repeat, and continues on forever. So in particular, let me make clear now, pi is not equal to 22 sevenths. That's not true, because 22 sevenths is a rational number. Pi is irrational. What is 22 sevenths, by the way? It's 3.1428. 5, 7, and that part repeats. So that's a repeating decimal. And you can see it differs starting at the 2. So it's wrong at that point. So 22 sevenths is a nice fraction. It's not a bad approximation, all things considered. But remember, it is an approximation. It's not equal to pi. So also, pi is not equal to any decimal from the actual decimal of pi where you stop somewhere, like 3.14. Okay, 3.14 is not equal to pi. Pi has all these other decimals. So, if you make an approximation for pi, please say so. Don't just say pi is equal to 22 sevenths or some similar incorrect statement. Okay, let's go back to my list. And having looked at some area formulas, we will now look at a very famous theorem, the Pythagorean theorem. And I will also show you a proof of this, a visual proof that's really very old. But let's go ahead and state the theorem first. The Pythagorean theorem. Of course, I'm using my abbreviation for theorem here throughout. I've done that before. And this is a theorem that is one directional, although I will say the uh, backwards direction is also true. Although that's not what I'm going to prove here right now. We're just going to do the one direction. And here is a visual way of stating the theorem. This is an, a one directional theorem, so it can be written as an if-then statement. If you start out with a right triangle, here's my right triangle, that's a triangle with a single right angle of sides A, B, and C. Then, here's the then part of the statement. So remember that arrow goes like this. The then part of the statement is that A squared plus B squared equals C squared. So any right triangle has this property. And this really is kind of an amazing property. The fact that if you take a square that's built on the short side plus the area of a square built on the long side, you get an area of the square built on the hypotenuse. This was known a long, long time ago. In fact, the proof I'm going to show you is from China. Here's the proof. And it is from about 200 BC in China. And it's a beautiful picture proof, so I wanted to show you this. And that's an old proof. 200 BC is a long time ago. All right, here's how the proof is going to proceed. First of all, we're going to take that right triangle we had on the previous page, and I'm going to write it right here upside down. So here's that right triangle. Here's the right angle. Here's side A, here's side B, and here is side C. Okay? Now I'm going to build a square using copies of this triangle. I will now draw the triangle here. So there's the right angle. There's A, B, and C again. Then another copy here. With luck, I'll make these all look pretty much the same. Here's B, here's A, and here's C. And finally, the final copy, which will fit right in here. And this side will be A, this will be B, and this will be C. 
Okay, so I've constructed a square. I've set this up so it has four right angles and that at each, where all of these pieces meet here, these are lined up in a line. Okay, here, 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 and here. Okay, now I want to confirm that the inside part, this thing that looks like a square in the middle with four sides of, of length C, I want to confirm that that's a square. And here's how I'll do it. First, let me remind you of something. You might remember that a triangle has 180 degrees in it if you add the three angles. Now in this triangle we have a right angle so that's 90 degrees. So the other two angles, this smaller angle here and this larger angle here, have to add themselves to 90 degrees so that the total is 180. Another fact I want to remind you of. 180 degrees is the angle of a straight line, okay, or a flat angle like that. Now, let's come over here to this corner, because all the corners in here will be the same. Let's just examine this corner. I would like to confirm that that's a right angle, so that I will know that the inside is a square. You'll see why I need that later. Well, let's see what I have here. I have these laid up along a line, which means this large angle here is 180 degrees. Now, what makes up that angle? Well, I've got a small angle here, which is a copy of this small angle above, and I've got a large angle here, which is a copy of this large angle. Now, these two add to 90. These two here also add to 90. This is a straight angle. It's a straight line. So by that, can, we can conclude that the angle in here must be 90 degrees. Okay? So I have determined that that's 90 degrees, which means that the inside here is a square. Okay. With that in mind, I can go ahead now and draw my conclusion, which will be the Pythagorean Theorem. And I'll bring the picture back so you can see it. But let me set up the rest of the argument. I'm going to divide this into two parts. On the left, I will write area of the whole square. Okay, let's look back at the picture. Here is the square. What is the area of the whole square? Well, each side is A plus B. So we know how to get the area of a square. It's A plus B, one side, squared. Now, there's another way to get the area of the whole square. The area of all the pieces. I had that square broken up into pieces, so the area of the square will be equal to the area of all the pieces. Bring back the picture. What do the area of the pieces look like? Well, we have this inner square, which is of side C, so its area is C squared. And then we have the areas of these triangles. They're all the same, so I have four times the area of any one of them. And I know the area of a triangle. I just did that formula. So I have C squared, which is the inner square, plus four times the area of any one of the triangles. That's one-half A times B. Well, let's go a little further now. A plus B quantity squared is a binomial square we've seen before. We know how to multiply this. A squared plus 2AB plus B squared equals C squared plus, well, 4 times a half is 2, so I have 2AB. Well, notice I have AB common to both sides. Subtract it away. If you like, you can draw a little sign like this to mark it out. What's left? On the left, A squared plus B squared. On the right, C squared. Aha! We now have exactly the result I predicted we would get. And it gotten from looking at this really very pretty picture. And this is a proof from China around 200 BC. So now you know, I hope, and believe that the Pythagorean theorem is true. Let me show you two examples I want to make a point of. Here's one. And this is just a little problem. Let's just go ahead and practice this. Suppose we have this situation. We're given a rectangular region. And it's rectangular, so I'll put a right angle in one corner to remind us. And suppose we know that the longer length is x, the shorter length is 3, and the length inside here, the diagonal, is 20. And what we want to do is find that longer length x. Well, of course, this is easy. We use the Pythagorean theorem. Let's just recopy the right triangle that we need to look at. Here's a right triangle with x, 3, and 20. 
Well, by the Pythagorean theorem, I'll even write that out, by the Pythagorean theorem, what do we have? We know that 20 squared, the hypotenuse, must equal 3 squared plus x squared. That's just simply the statement of the Pythagorean theorem. Well, let me copy this onto the next page so I have a little more room. And uh, rewrite it the other way, say, so we can practice a technique I wanted to mention. 3 squared plus x squared equals 20 squared. Okay, that's the end of a mathematical sentence, so I'll put a period. I want to isolate x, so let's subtract the 3 squared from both sides. So I have x squared is equal to 20 squared minus 3 squared. You may notice that I am putting off multiplying out the squares. I'm going to put it off as long as I can. Well, that's as long as I can put it off. But you never know. Sometimes things will work out nicely if you leave it this way. In fact, if you want to try this and you can do it yourself, it's probably easier to just realize that what you've got here is a difference of two squares. Let's look at that. Difference of two squares. Remember how to factor that? That's 20 minus 3 times 20 plus 3. So you've got 17 here times 23. Now whether you think that's easier or you multiply 20 squared and subtract away 3 squared, it doesn't matter. Either way, you're going to get 391 after however much effort. And that is a period. So once again, just to remind you, what I've got here is a long sentence. One long sentence. So I had an earlier sentence up here and now I have this long sentence. So I can conclude that x squared is equal to this, is equal to this, is equal to this, is equal to this. So if I wanted to, I could summarize by writing x squared is equal to 391. Now I'd like to unsquare x, so I'm going to take the square root of both sides. The square root of x squared is by definition absolute value of x, and the square root of 391 is just the plus square root of 391. But here I'm only interested in positive x's because x is a length. Remember, it's the length of the side of the rectangle. So since this is a length, I will just take the positive choice, x equals square root of 391, and that is the solution. Now, you may not find that very satisfying, so let's go ahead and approximate it and get a decimal. This is approximately 19.77. So I'll put that there because that's probably the way you'll do it in practice. So there's just a little effort to use the Pythagorean theorem. This is a typical kind of problem. Now let me show you one more fact about this Pythagorean theorem in the form of another example. This is a handy example. This just points out the fact that if you have a triangle with the right angle in one corner and the two legs are of side one, then what is the length of that hypotenuse? Well, using the Pythagorean theorem, x squared is equal to 1 squared plus 1 squared. x squared is equal to 2. Well, what number when squared equals 2? What positive number? Because x is a length again. I'll write length here. Because x is a length, of course, it is the positive square root of 2. In other words, when you have a triangle that has two, a right triangle that has two sides, two legs of length 1, the hypotenuse is of length square root of 2. I'll even rewrite that down here in the corner just to get it in your mind. If this is side 1, this is side 1, then this is side square root of 2 opposite the right angle. And that is the very last thing we're going to do in Unit 0 on Basics. So after this, we'll be coming back and we'll be starting the course proper. And I'll see you then. Music